The scripture reading for today is 1 John chapter 5, verses 5 through 12. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater, because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. Whoever believes in the son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe, God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony that God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has the life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. Good morning, IBC. It's great to see you and I'm glad to have those of you joining us online, glad you're here. Uh, I've missed you guys. I've been out the last couple of weeks. Uh, I had the chance to teach a doctor of ministry course uh, at Dallas Seminary. And the first week, we took our students away on retreat to a Benedictine monastery up in Oklahoma. It was unbelievable. It was so great. Last week, then, we were together on campus. But uh, I've missed being with you guys. Glad to be back. We are finishing our sermon series on 1 John this morning. So if you have a Bible or you have it on your device, grab it and let's go. 1 John chapter 5. I gotta tell you as we start this morning um, that about 15 years ago, I went through something of an existential crisis brought on by writing a PhD dissertation, which, yeah, writing a PhD dissertation brings on a crisis in and of itself, but this particular crisis in my faith actually came from my research that one of the key figures in my doctoral research was the 16th century reformer John Calvin. And as I read John Calvin, I came across his very famous definition of faith. And there was something about that definition that, that shook me. Calvin has this famous definition of faith where he says, now we shall possess the right definition of faith if we call it a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence towards us, founded upon the freely given promise in Christ Jesus and both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, when I first came across that definition, there's a whole lot that I loved about it, right? There's something rich about this definition of faith. It's Trinitarian. It it, it points to the, the love of God the Father that we can have confidence in because of the work of Jesus, his son, that's revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts by the Holy Spirit. There's something about this definition that is is beautiful and and, and true. And yet for me, it actually provoked a, a sense of crisis because of those two little words early in the definition, firm and certain. Calvin says, faith is firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence towards us. And I had to confront the reality that that when I think about my faith, firm and certain would not be the words that I would reach for to describe it. When I think about my journey of faith, I'm much more prone to reach for words like thin and fragile. That I'm one that throughout my the time as a Christian, I've been a person who is prone to doubt. In fact, there was a time in my life where I just felt like I could never become a pastor because a pastor can't stand up in front of a congregation and preach the word of God with as much doubt as I deal with. Somehow I thought I could become a theologian nonetheless. <laughs> 
But here's what I discovered as I continued my research. I read a few hundred more pages and I I came across a place in Calvin's writing where Calvin the pastor kind of uh, tempered Calvin the theologian. Because later in his book, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, Calvin says, surely while we teach that faith ought to be certain and assured, we cannot imagine any certainty that is not tinged with doubt or any assurance that is not assailed by some anxiety. On the other hand, we say believers are in perpetual conflict with their own unbelief. The true believer, Calvin says, is in perpetual conflict with their own unbelief. And I just wonder in a room this size if if that sentiment doesn't resonate with many of you the way it does with me. But, But here's what I've come to discover That when it comes to the life of faith, that that the true Christian is in perpetual conflict with their own unbelief, or said differently, doubt is part of the deal. And I think there's some of you in the room this morning that that that's the message that you need to hear. The, The message that you need to hear today is simply that doubt is part of the deal. In fact, there may be somebody that needs to just have somebody look them in the eyes and tell them that. So would you do that? Would you look somebody in the eye sitting next to you and just tell them that affirmation? Doubt is part of the deal. Right? Doubt is part of the deal when it comes to the life of faith. As Frederick Buechner said, if there's no room for doubt, there's no room for me. That doubt is part of the deal. But here's what you also need to know that you can follow Jesus even while you doubt. You can follow Jesus even while you doubt. That the struggle to believe is not the same as unbelief. And that all of us find ourselves at times in our lives where we're like that father in Mark's gospel who comes to Jesus and says, I believe, help my unbelief. This morning, we're gonna look at a passage together that I think is aimed at at strengthening the tenacity of our faith. You see, when, when Calvin writes about our faith being firm and certain, I don't think he's talking primarily about the strength of our faith. I think he's talking about the tenacity of our faith. This faith that doesn't let go, it doesn't give up, it continues to hold on, even while sometimes it feels like it's only holding on by a thread. And this passage today, I believe, will strengthen the tenacity of our faith. John is writing to a community of Christians who are struggling. They're struggling with the assaults of anxiety, of doubt. They, they're a church that's been um, infiltrated by false teaching, and that that false teaching has taken out members of their community. And now they find themselves asking questions about the fundamental elements of their faith. And part of the reason why we've explored this this series from this book is that John reminds us this is what is essential to Christian belief and practice. And now as he comes to the end of his book, I believe John is writing to to try to strengthen the faith of these struggling Christians. And as he does so, he points to four testimonies. We're gonna see in this passage a reference to four different testimonies that are intended to strengthen the tenacity of our faith. Two of those testimonies are objective and two of them are subjective, right? Two of them are historical and two of them are experiential. And I believe that these words have the capacity for us today to strengthen the tenacity of our faith. Will you look with me at 1 John chapter five, beginning in verse one. John writes and says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the father loves his child as well. Now, remember a few weeks ago when we talked about the connection between love and knowledge and obedience? Watch this play out. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. His commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world even our faith. 
Do you remember a, a few weeks back, we talked about the way in which John connects these three words when you see one, lo, know, love, obey, that oftentimes you see the others right there around it. Because John makes an essential connection. To know God is to obey God. And to obey God is to love people. That we can't claim to know God, we can't claim to love God if we don't obey God, if we don't love people. But then John shifts and begins talking about this idea of overcoming the world two times in what we just read and then a third time that we'll see in a minute. John talks about the idea of overcoming the world. How is it that we overcome the world? How is it that we experience victory against the onslaught of all that life throws our way? That we overcome, that we, that we find victory in the face of opposition, that we, that we overcome and find victory in the face of, of, of suffering and grief, that we overcome and find victory against all the struggles and, and all the trials that life brings our way. How do we find victory? John's answer to the question comes in those last few words. Even our faith. The way in which we endure, and and not just endure, but we overcome, the way in which we experience victory when all of life seems to be coming against us is by holding tenaciously to faith. I love the way that that Calvin says it, to, to have firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence towards us, that God is good, that he is good to us, that he is good for us that he loves us, that we overcome the world by clinging tenaciously in faith to the goodness and love of God. I had the chance, as I shared with you, to teach a doctor of ministry uh, course over the last couple of weeks, and, and one of the things that we did in that group is we just had the opportunity to kind of accompany one another through the things that we're facing in life, and, and one of the women in my class was just sharing that she's facing some pretty major life decisions, that she's come to a sense of fork in the road of life and, and trying to determine which way to go and, and just feeling very overwhelmed by the circumstances that she finds herself in. And as we processed and prayed together, I shared with her a story that, that I've shared over and over. You may have heard me tell it, but it's a story I tell over and over because I need to hear it again and again. It's a story that Brendan Manning tells in his book, Ruthless Trust, that's about a guy named William Kavanaugh, an ethicist, a a scholar. And Kavanaugh found himself at one of those forks in the road of life, one of those times where he was trying to discern the future and things seemed very uncertain and overwhelming. And in the midst of that season, he had the opportunity to travel to Calcutta and to spend time with Mother Teresa and the sisters there who were ministering to the poor. And during that trip, he had the opportunity to personally visit with Mother Teresa. And they shared and talked together and they came to the end of their time together and, and he said to her, Mother Teresa, will you pray for me? And she says, of course I will pray for you. How, how can I pray for you? And in the midst of this time of, of, of decision and, and uncertainty, he said to her, will you pray for me for clarity? Pray that God gives me clarity. And she said, no. She said, I I will not pray for clarity. I'll pray for trust. And you see, there are those times in our lives that the the deep desire of our hearts is for clarity, God. And yet, very rarely do we find that prayer answered. Because our deepest need is not for clarity. Our deepest need It's for trust. How how do we overcome the world and all of the things that we face in this life? Faith. Clinging tenaciously to God in trust. And then John begins to talk about these testimonies that strengthen the tenacity of our faith. Look with me there. We'll pick up in verse five. John says, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who who believes, who who trusts that Jesus is the son of God. And this is the one who came by the water and blood, Jesus Christ, 
He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. Don't you feel so much better now? That's just, that's just so abundantly clear, isn't it? What is going on? Well, here's the thing. When I want to feel like I can still read my Greek New Testament, I'll pull my Greek New Testament down off the shelf. And, and if I want to feel good about my ability to read it, I will open up to 1 John because 1 John has the simplest Greek in all the New Testament. Simple vocabulary, simple grammar, syntax. It's simple to read, but here's the thing. 1 John may be one of the most simple books to read, but it's one of the most complex books to interpret. And this passage is the most complex passage in one of the most complex books in all the New Testament. What on earth is John up to talking about the, the water and the blood and the, the spirit? That doesn't seem to resonate, John, with exactly where I'm struggling. Well, here's what you need to know. You have to understand the struggle that his audience was facing to see how it applies to us, to see how it strengthens our faith. And John seems to be responding to this false teaching that was a threat to his community, a threat to his church. And it seems to be that this false teaching involved the perpetuating of the idea that was really taking hold at this time and would eventually grow over the next couple of centuries. This idea that there was a man named Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. He was a good man, he was a holy man, but he was just a man. And that at his baptism, the Christ of God came into Jesus the man. At his baptism, and that the Christ of God came into Jesus the man and, and empowered him throughout his ministry. But then this false teaching said that, that at the time in which Jesus the man was crucified, the Christ of God left him. Because the Christ of God couldn't be crucified. And these teachers were saying what really mattered was the teaching, the, the knowledge, that we're saved by spiritual insights. And so they said that, that the, the Christ came into him after his baptism and left him before his crucifixion. And this is exactly what John is trying to combat here by talking about the water and the blood. There are multiple interpretive options, different kinds of traditions of interpretation of this passage. Some say the water and the blood is a reference to the sacraments, the water of baptism, the blood of the cup and the Lord's Supper. This was actually the view that John Calvin held. And far be it for me to disagree with John Calvin, but in this instance, I disagree with John Calvin. John talks about the fact that Jesus came through the water and the blood, not that he comes to us in the sacraments, but that he came through the water and the blood. And in the, the communion, the Lord's Supper, there's both the, the cup and the bread, the body and the blood. So this would be a strange way of referring to the sacraments. Some have suggested that the water and the blood is the reference back to what we find in John's gospel when Christ is on the cross and the soldier pierces his side. And it says, and blood and water flowed. Some say that's what John is referring to here. The thing with that is that we have it in reverse, that there it's... it's um, blood and water, and here it's water and blood. And it also seems that in this passage, John is distinguishing that he came through the water and the blood, not the water only, but the water and the blood, two testimonies. So what's going on with this water and blood? This is John referring to Christ's baptism and Christ's crucifixion. This is John's way of saying that he was fully God and fully human before, during, and after his baptism. And he was fully God and fully human before, during, and after his crucifixion. And, and it's interesting because in, in their day, they struggled with the idea that, that God could become a man. We, we struggle perhaps in our culture more with the idea that a man could be fully God. And yet, this is what John is saying. He says, first, there's the testimony of the water and that we can find our faith strengthened by remembering the testimony of Christ's baptism. And baptism in its essence is the idea of identification. 
We've talked before about the idea that, that when we hear the word baptize, we immediately think of what we do in church. And yet in the first century world, that word baptize actually had much more common use. It just simply meant to dunk or to immerse, that, that they would take a piece of white cloth and they would immerse it. They would baptize it in red dye. And when they pulled it out, it's red cloth. It's a sense of identification. And that when we are baptized, we are identifying with Jesus. But it's very important for us to recognize that when Jesus was baptized, he was identifying with us. You see, Jesus went to the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist. And the baptism of John the Baptist was a baptism for repentance. He was calling people to come out and be baptized for the repentance of their sins. Jesus didn't have any sins to repent of. That's why when um, when John saw Jesus standing in line to be baptized, he's like, no, 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 no. I need you to baptize me. Jesus didn't have any sins to repent of, and yet Jesus' baptism by John in the Jordan was his way of identifying with flawed, fallen, broken humanity. He identifies with us in his baptism. Kim and I have had the opportunity three different times to travel uh, to Israel with Insight for Living Ministries, Chuck Swindoll. And incidentally, we're going back this coming March. If anybody wants to go to Israel, we're gonna be having a bus and I'll teach in like 22 different locations across the land. It's unbelievable. Okay, back to sermon. <laughs> One of the places that's so cool that we get to visit is the Jordan River, the traditional baptism site of Jesus. That this is what tradition tells us is the place where John carried out his ministry where Jesus would have been baptized. And I love to, to be able to do a little devotional standing there on the banks of the Jordan River, but every time I look out into that water, there's one thought that comes to my mind. I'm so glad I'm not getting into that water because <laughs> it is murky, it is dirty. The Jordan River as it flows through is just, it's filthy. We do our baptisms on a beach at the Sea of Galilee rather than in the Jordan. It's, it's really dirty in that place. And, and yet I think about that. And I think about the baptism of Jesus. And I think about the significance of that identification with flawed, fallen, broken humanity. That, that Jesus, in his baptism, entered into that muddy water. Right? That he entered into that filth. And in an important sense to really capture the essence of what he had come to do, which was to enter into the filth of our world, to rescue us, to give us a hope beyond it, that, that he identified himself taking on flesh and entering into our world, that, that the God of Christianity is the, the only God on offer who doesn't stand at a distance, who doesn't just remain in pristine heaven watching the suffering of his creatures but that it's only the God of Christianity who enters in, who immerses himself, who identifies with flawed, fallen, and broken humanity. John tells us that we can remember Christ's baptism, his identification with us to find our faith strengthened. He says, that we should look to the testimony of the water, that is Jesus' baptism, and, and second, to, to the blood, that is Jesus' crucifixion. And again here, what, what John is trying to refute, what he, he's counteracting is the teaching that the man who died on the cross was merely a man. He's refuting the error that, that the Christ of God departed from Jesus the man before he went to the cross. And he says, no, the blood of the man who died on the cross was the blood of the Son of God, the, the Christ. That Jesus is fully God who has sacrificed himself for the sin of the world. I love the way that New Testament scholar I. Howard Marshall captures this when he writes about this passage. And he says, as soon as we reduce the death of Jesus to that of a mere man, so soon we lose the cardinal point of the New Testament doctrine of atonement that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And in the last analysis, 
The doctrine of atonement means that God himself bears our sins and shows that the final reality of the universe is his sin-bearing, pardoning love. The final reality of the universe is God's sin-bearing, pardoning love. When I was going through my crisis of faith, I remembered the story of one of my professors, Dr. John Hanna, a story in the Dallas Seminary. My favorite professors, and, and I remember Dr. Hanna talking about a season in his, his life where he was going through a crisis of faith that he had all these kinds of intellectual questions that he just couldn't quite wrestle to the ground and he found himself just deeply disturbed in his soul about his struggle with doubt. And he said in the midst of this struggle as he's just voicing all of these questions, all of these angst kind of feelings, that in the midst of all that, that, that his wife simply asked him, but what about Jesus? what are you gonna do with Jesus? And it was that question that that rescued him from his struggles. It didn't mean that all those questions just went away. It just reminded him, what is at the core of my faith? The love of Jesus. You see, it, it seems to me that the reason that many people find themselves leaving their faith often have very little to do with Jesus, right? Many of the reasons that people that grow up in Christian homes, that grow up in Christian churches, that wind up walking away from Christianity, many of the reasons that they do so actually have very little to do with Jesus. Sometimes it's, it's questions and struggles of, of the reconciliation of science and faith. For some, it's the struggle of the problem of evil. How can a good God exist in a world like this? And for some, it's their own experience of suffering. God, where were you? How could you let that happen? For some, it's problems that they find with the Old Testament, that their understanding of passages in the Old Testament that they just find deeply problematic. Oftentimes, the reasons that people walk away from their faith actually have very little to do with Jesus. If you're here this morning and you find yourself feeling like you might be prone to walk away from your faith, I hope that you'll be encouraged to know that 100% of the earliest followers of Jesus walked away from their faith. That 100% of those who were the, the closest followers, the dearest friends of Jesus, when they saw him die, they abandoned all hope that he really was the Messiah. That they found themselves so assailed by doubt that they walked away until they saw him alive. And I think that if we were to go to the Apostle John with some of those questions that really perplex us, the things that really cause us to struggle and to stumble in our faith, if we were to go to him and present him with those questions, you know what I think he might say to us in response? I think he might say, I don't know a lot about that, but here's what I do know. I saw him bleed and die. And then I saw him alive again that at the core, at the essence of our faith is the reality that Christ died for our sins and that he rose from the dead. That we don't believe because we have all of our questions answered. We believe because Jesus got up again. John says, cling tenaciously to your faith by remembering the blood that Christ died for our sins and he rose from the dead. But then there's a third testimony that John references here. Did, did you see it? John talks about the spirit. That, that these three testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, the baptism, the cross, and the spirit. Two objective, and this is the first subjective. Two historical, these happened in history that people saw 
One now that is experiential, that happens inside of us, the testimony of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, there are actually several places in the New Testament that talk about the idea that the Spirit testifies or bears witness. John, uh, in John's gospel, John chapter 15, the words of Jesus, that Jesus says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And Paul talks about this same idea in Romans chapter eight, verse 16, when he says the spirit himself testifies with our spirit or to our spirit that we are God's children. The spirit testifies, bears witness. By the way, this was actually the subject of my uh, PhD dissertation. If any of you are ever struggling with insomnia, I have 287 pages of doctoral dissertation about the testimony of the Holy Spirit that I can send to you, guaranteed to put you to sleep, right? The, the title, The Spirit's Witness, a historical and theological examination of the testimonium spiritus sancti internum, because it just wasn't quite pretentious enough without the Latin. Um, <laughs> The Spirit testifies, bears witness. What does that mean? Well, I think it's the same idea that Paul conveys when he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse three. And he says, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, on a surface level reading of that, that's kind of preposterous, right? Of course, anybody can say Jesus is Lord But what Paul is getting at, what Paul means, is that nobody can say that and really believe it apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. The the testimony of the Holy Spirit isn't the Spirit whispering in our ears and saying, Jesus is real, the gospel is true. The testimony of the Holy Spirit is his persuasive power at work in our hearts, convincing us to believe. And this is one of the things that I love so much about that definition. Faith is the firm and certain knowledge, the tenacious knowledge of God's benevolence towards us, founded on the freely given promise in Jesus, both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Friends, the tenacity of your faith is not a human accomplishment. The tenacity of your faith is the work of the Holy Spirit. And there may be times where it feels like you're holding on by a thread. But what we can have confidence in is that not only are we holding on by a thread, but we're being held by one so much stronger than us. The water, Jesus' baptism. The blood, Jesus' crucifixion. The spirit, the persuasive power of the spirit at work in our hearts. And then there's one more that John talks about here. Pick up in verse nine. He says, we accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it's the testimony of God. That sort of makes sense. God's testimony would be greater than human testimony. Which he has given, God has given this testimony about his son. Whoever believes in the son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. John says, this is the testimony of God that he has given us the gift of eternal life. That when we believe, when we trust in Jesus, when we trust that he's come into the world to identify with flawed, fallen, broken humanity, when we trust his sin-bearing love poured out on the cross, when we trust in the reality of his resurrection, when when we believe in that, that God gives us the gift of life, and oh, what a life it is he gives. It's called here eternal life, and we hear that phrase, and we think it's about duration. We think it's about a life that lasts forever, and it does mean that, but it means so much more than just that. 
This little phrase, zoe eonion, that gets translated eternal life, more literally means the life of the age. It's the life of the age to come. That whatever is true of that age that is to come, joy, peace, healing, and beauty, and reconciliation, that it's not about that we live this life until we die and then we go and enter into that life. It's that that life enters into us now when we believe that we receive the gift of life, real, rich, succulent, lasting life. And John says, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. I can't put it much more clear and straightforward than that. He who has the son has life. John points to these four testimonies, the testimony of the water, Jesus' baptism, the testimony of the blood, Jesus' cross, the testimony of the spirit at work in our hearts and the testimony of the gift of eternal life that is found in the Son and in the Son alone. Can I offer you today four ways that I think we can respond? Four applications that I think will help to strengthen the tenacity of our faith when we find ourselves in the midst of that struggle to believe? The first one is this. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism. When, when you find yourself struggling with the circumstances of life or struggling with doubt, remember your baptism. In baptism, you identified with Jesus, which recalls his identification with you. And for many of us, we don't experience much more of the sense of the aliveness of God in our lives than in that time in which we make the commitment to be baptized. When I was at the monastery in Oklahoma, there was one of the services where we were gathered in the church and Abbot Lawrence, the leader of that monastery, he had a little brush and he walked around to the monks and then he came out to us. He dipped that brush in water and he just went like this, just flinging water over all of us. The whole idea is that when we feel the water, we remember our baptism. And as your pastor, I just wish I had one of those little brushes. <laughs> I'd need like a fire hose to get the people in the back back there. <laughs> Remember your baptism, the aliveness of God in your life in that season of your journey. Second, run to the table. When you find yourself in those seasons of struggle, run to the table. And, and the reason that we come here every single week Every week we need to be reminded of God's love for us and reminded not just with our minds but reminded with our bodies, with our senses, with the sense of sight, with the sense of touch, with the sense of taste, with the sense of smell. And some people sort of go, why do we do it every week? I mean, doesn't it lose something special when you do it every week? Friends, I tell my kids I love them every single day. Would it be more special if I waited and just did that once a month? maybe once a quarter. No, I tell them every single day, and friends, this table is the I love you of your father to you, to be reminded of the extent of his love for you. When you find yourself in those seasons of struggle, run to the table. Feast upon Christ in your heart. Remember your baptism. Run to the table. Third, invite the Spirit Invite the Spirit to strengthen your faith, to work his persuasive power in your heart. We sometimes sing that song around here, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. It's good for us to be reminded that he is here whether we welcome him or not, but that he moves in our lives in response to our invitation. That's why we say, you are welcome, have your way. And when you find yourself in those seasons of struggle, Cry out to the Spirit to work his persuasive power to help you cling tenaciously to your faith. Remember your baptism. Run to the table. Invite the Spirit. And finally, embrace the life. Embrace the promise 
of the life of the age to come, a life that is filled with joy, healing, peace, and live that life in the world, to show the world the life that you've received through your faith in Jesus. As we join him in his mission to bless the world, we find ourselves blessed by him and strengthened in our faith. Embrace the life. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that in these moments of response that your spirit would move in this place. God, there are are some who are here this morning and, and their takeaway, what they needed to hear came really early on. The doubt is part of the deal and that they can continue to follow Christ even while they struggle with doubt, that that struggling to believe is not the same as unbelief. And Lord, I pray that for all of us, but particularly for those this morning who are just in a place of struggle, Lord, that you would strengthen the tenacity of our faith as we remember the way in which Christ entered into the mess of this world, identified with flawed, fallen, broken humanity, and the way that he expressed the sin-bearing love of God on the cross and the way in which he triumphed over death through his resurrection. And Lord, that, that we would be strengthened by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit at work in our hearts and that we would embrace the life that you've given us through your son. And God, I pray for anybody who's here in this room this morning who has never embraced that life for the very first time, never come to that place where they have trusted in Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would draw them to yourself by the power of your spirit today, that today would be the day that they cross that line of faith, that they say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you came into this world. I believe that you died for our sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Give me forgiveness and the hope of eternal life. And so Lord, lead us now in this time of response, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen.